about watching another video game review brought to you by Armada and me, the one true Omni Gamer, Boss Bronze. You know, Soul Calibur 5 really kind of let me down if you couldn't tell by my review, so I need something to escape. Bring me back to the love and joy of video gaming. And hopefully this next game I bought a week or so ago can do just that. It's called Kingdom El Almayur Reckoning. And I'm hoping I'm saying this right. Now this game somewhat came out of nowhere. Only till late last year did I find out so much about it. And it has quite a bit of a pedigree to it. Not only being created by Big Huge Games, 38 Studios, and of course, the game conglomerates to end all game conglomerates. EA have a hand in this, but its three main captains on this ship are R.A. Salvatore, a well-renowned and known author of both fantasy and sci-fi novels, Todd McFarlane, the guy who created Spawn, enough said there, and Ken Rollison, who earned his stripes by working on the famed Elder Scrolls series. Yeah, wrap your mind around that. So with three big names, two game studios, and EA, of course, is this game too big to fail, or will it sink like a stone on a Sunday? Let's find out. Well, the game sort of starts like this. Uh, you know what? I think I'll let the game actually explain this one. From the beginning, we were wrong. And only now, well into the second decade of the conflict, have we begun to understand the mistakes we have made. We lived in harmony among the Fae, in a world awakened to new magic. Perhaps we should have foreseen what might be born on this rising tide. What force might awaken. A force powerful enough to twist even the eternal and the mutual favor. <laughs> But Gadflo, the new king of the Winter Court, surprised us all. Singular among his people, he was all that other Fae were not. Aggressive, ambitious, visionary. He had power like none we had ever seen. Terrible and deadly. <laughs> Gadflo and his followers, the Tuatha de Deon, believed that a new god was to be born in the east, beneath Gadflo's crystalline fortress of Amethyn. In the name of that god, they marched to war against the young races of Amalur. Against a mortal army, no matter the power of their god, we might have been victorious. But the Fae are creatures of magic, not bound by the laws of life and death. Each two eyes are fallen on the battlefield will soon rise again. For the Fae do not know death as we do. How could we stand against such a force? For ten years the war raged. For ten years the armies of men and Alpha fought and died. But as our numbers dwindled, we knew that it was only a matter of time. Our fate had been written. At least, that is what we believed. Until you died. So yeah, that's pretty much it. You're dead, and two gnomes are cutting your cold corpus. Corpus? Corpse? Whatever. They're taking you down to some place where you don't want to go. All the while shooting the breeze about you and how you die. From here, the character creator steps up where you get to customize your dead cadaver any way you wish. Give it a name, what religion you believe in, that sort of thing. After that, they reveal you on the slab there, and after that, they send you on your merry way through a chute. Now here's where things get a little interesting. You don't stay dead. That's right, you wake up on the top of a pile of corpses, get up and say, Man, what just happened there? Come party. But seriously though, you have no idea what's going on. You barely remember your own name. So, you get up to walk around to find out what's what. One tutorial later, you meet up with the head gnome in charge, and he explains that you were one of a million dead corpses found to test to see if they can bring back to life. The good news is, it worked. You are now alive once you were once dead. 
the bad news is a few people got a little testy of somehow manhandling the forces of nature and all, and so the facility is under attack, which you very well know. So he decides to sacrifice himself to distract the forces while you make your hasty escape, and thus you arrive topside on a big, beautiful world. And that's pretty much how the games start, and already it has more character development than Soul Calibur 5. Sorry, sorry. That's the last time I talk about Soul Calibur 5 for at least a good couple of months, I promise. Now in the interview with the developers of Reckoning, they had told people, it's even found on the website, is that this is going to be a prequel to a massively multiplayer online RPG. And goodness, that is the truth. This game is played like an offline single player MMO. Big, wide, a lot of people to talk to, and a familiar sense of fantasy whimsy. You move on to the great wide world where after a few more tutorials, you get to choose your class. And even the uninitiated of RPG players know the big three, warrior, rogue, and mage. But Reckoning does it in a very unique and different way. You, first of all, are allowed certain freedoms, meaning you can use any weapon, no cl no class locks. Meaning that if you want to be a big hulky warrior, but still want to sling spells with staffs and scepters, try saying that three times fast, you might as well can and enjoy doing it too. But hey, you want to be a rogue stealthily taking out people from the shadows, but you're getting sick and tired of getting knocked over by some errant leaf with a chip on her shoulder. Why, you can wear big heavy armor just like the big warriors do without any penalties. I'll say it again, no penalties. This is beautiful. Why stop there? You could be a jack of trades, rocking a heavy sword, rock a bow and arrow, and launch AOE out your fingertips almost every single engagement you tangle with. You'll be freaking unstoppable! Don't get me wrong, anything you use as a weapon or wear will help in one particular area or another. Heavy weapons are better for warriors. Leather armors are better for rogues because they up the critical hit average a few notches. And of course, that weak as heck cloth armor is great for recovering mana. It's how you decide to use this to your advantage. So if you want to be a better spellcaster, using that plus two hood of remembrance would be the best thing for you. But the game does not force you to play just one role, and that's it. It gives you freedom, baby, and that is a beautiful thing. But it doesn't even stop there, oh no. Every time you level up, you can specialize further into the big three, making your character however you want. Meaning, if you want to be better with heavy weapons and armor, go right ahead. If you want to be better in assassination, arrows, and small bladed weapons, <laughs> no one's stopping you. If you think that using all your spells, no matter what class you picked, or what way you want to train, is just gas guzzling all your mana, then become more mystic in the art of mysticism and reduce your MP intake. You could just blast spells all the live long day and you don't have to even come close to reach on empty on that bar. The only limit, people, is opportunity cost. Meaning that all the while you're focusing on your favorite skills and stats, you may lose out on focusing on one speciality and all that brings. Meaning some of the more higher ranked abilities may be lost to you. There are limits, people. Will you become a more well-rounded hero or be focused into one single category and gain access to all that high-level goodies? Decisions, decisions, people. Decisions, decisions. Moving on to the plus and minuses of this title, starting with the plus, combat system. In an MMO, some of the combat system range from inspired, slightly innovated, to, well, kind of boring. They decided to change it and flip it on its ear for Reckoning, give it a much familiar look. I'll see if you can guess just by these few clips here. Got it yet? Still nothing?
I knew you figured it out. Yes, it is very familiar to God of War, down to the very colorful executions in which the game calls Reckoning. Not to spoil so much about the story, basically your character has the unique power of fate. Changing it, destroying it, that sort of thing. What that means to you is that every time you kill something, you build up your fate meter. And once that meter is all ready to go, you unleash the power to change fate. Which means you turn Super Saiyan, and not only do you become stronger, but faster as well. In this form, you easily dispatch any who stand before you. And once you get to the final victim, just execute the Reckoning Finisher, and you can take down your opponent with flair and panache. Of course, fighting outside Reckoning Mode is pretty impressive too. Not only do you have the ability to dodge and block at all times, like I said, no limitations, but your general fighting styles are pretty well done too. Have daggers, you can hit quicker, faster, but not much muscle. Great Hammer, on the other hand, you can smash things into paste, but that slow kickback and pick up at each swing makes you a little exposed if you're not careful. But don't worry, you have nine different weapon sets to choose from, so I'm pretty sure you can find what style fits your way of attack. Another tip of my hat towards this game is how smart the combat of the enemies are. This game could have easily degenerated into your classic button mashing side scroll for 3D. But each enemies not only have a way to attack you, but they actually employ tactics. <laughs> you think fighting wolves in your standard RPGs is easy? Try it in Reckoning. They'll stay really far away and they still make use of pack mentality. Each one will circle around you like a vulture after a freshly killed carcass, and they'll charge at you one at a time. Again, it sounds easy until it's actually put into play. You gotta use timing between dodges and blocks to take out not only the one that's attacking you, but the friends who's gonna charge you next. It is rather intense. Other enemies have specialized defenses against your attacks. Like trolls, for example. They're pretty much immune to magic, or rather, magic doesn't hurt them very well. So you either gotta switch to a bow, or try to knock his sense in him with a hammer club. On the other hand, some enemy rogues and assassins are so quick and nimble, you can't get a beat on them with any kind of arrow. I mean, you can keep trying, but sooner or later they're gonna bridge the gap and they're gonna shiv you like you wouldn't believe. It's that kind of stuff that really, really impresses me. Even if it's familiar to God of War, they took it to a new upgradable direction and I approve. Another thing they have that's very similar to another successful game is the colorful art style that is World of Warcraft. Everything is very, very colorful. Straight out of a storybook or some sort of new age fantasy novel. The greens are greens, the browns are browns. When it's night, everything's got that sort of nighttime hue to it. It's all very wonderful. Even though the camera is a little close to your character and you can't really see all this good stuff, this artistry and whatnot, even if you're fighting or not fighting, still, when you take a moment to turn around and look skyward, it's a pretty good picture. The final thing that this game excels at is keeping you very, very busy. Everyone in this entire kingdom needs help. Whether it's the wayward alchemist looking for her assistant, or some sort of poor farm girl looking for her husband, talking to some strange and mythical creatures, or just taking down a bunch of thugs who are just hassling the poor townsfolk, you won't have a lack of things to do, trust me. Heck, even if you're done trying to help random people and just want to help yourself, you can always break the law. Switch to thuggetry mode, as I'll just call it, and you could just hassle the poor town folks you once saved from the thugs by being a bigger thug yourself. You could steal their stuff, beat them up, or kill their livestock. All in a day's work, right? Of course, that may end you up in jail, but if you're sneaky enough or brave enough, you can just fight the authorities. My favorite method of dealing with the law is just bribing them away. Why waste my arrows or my blade fighting guards when they can just go away for a few hundred gold? 
Heck, you could even take up a trade. Blacksmithing, alchemy, hey, maybe if you stay crafting some crystals, you could sell anything you make for some hefty blodo, or use yourself in your adventures. Reckoning, like I said before, will keep you plenty busy. So yeah, I don't really want to be that kind of guy, but it's time for the minuses of the game. And I gotta tell you, they're not so bad compared to, uh, <coughs> but I gotta lay the cards down and call it as I see it. First of all, the races. They're kind of boring. The player races, first of all, you can be either two humans or two types of elves. That's it. I mean, you know, they say they're different, but when you really get down to it, they're not really that different. They're just a different shade of stats, in my opinion. Now, the non-player races are a little bit more interesting. Personally, I would have liked to play as a gnome. Or the creatures that never died, which they're called Fae. They're somewhat interesting, even though they have sort of an elven mentality to darn selves. But no, you can't play as them. You have to sit and content being your somewhat blandish human-like or elven-like character. Oh, um, another thing, the professions are boring. Not being a warrior, rogue, or class, I'm talking about the extracurriculars, like being a blacksmith and sage and whatnot. I said before, yeah, playing a lot of MMOs mean that I've tried a lot of these professions, and all the other professions I've ever played on any other MMO are much more interesting than the ones I'm playing now. They don't really add anything to your character. I mean, you might have an advantage a couple of times in the game, about an hour or so, until you either find a much better weapon, or you buy a much better weapon, armor, crystal, what have you. All the good stuff are literally everywhere here. Invest in persuasion, lockpicking, and mercantilism, and you can be set for the whole game. So that means you don't really need any other profession, and that's really sad. They should even just liven things up with a few more of the unique professions I've seen over RPG dumb, like engineer for goodness sake. Heck, even Queen might have been a little better, if not a little more interesting. I don't know. Something to spice it up a bit, because what it is right now is putting me to sleep. And in order to keep this running gag going, the people are boring. Yeah. In RPGs, you're no stranger to actually having to talk to random people. They usually just have a few good things to say and you can move on. But in this game, anyone with a name over their head, other than generic citizen or traveler or what have you, has something to say about your current uh, role in whatever location and mission you're on. And that is a little bit monotonous. You could skip all they're saying quick enough by pressing the X button, but you still have to plow through all their useless dialogue in order to find information that you didn't know. And that's boring! I don't even know this guy's turnip recipe in order to find out where the evil Lord of Zill lives. Come on! Finally, in keeping with an offline single-player MMO, they kept something that I may have not have. Foot travel and traffic. Meaning is that you have to cross miles of virtual landscape in order to get from one location to another. Oh sure, that gets easier once you get to the actual place, you can just travel back and forth. But a lot of this area is pretty long, if not treacherous, and enemies are usually a great diversion through all this span we have to traverse. But most of it is just freaking long. Not there yet. Finally, jeez. First, speak with the Castellan. 
If the key is a copy, then you must seek the master locksmith and tear its rest. Oh come on, I just got here! Ah. However, compared to other games, <coughs> these small minuses are just nitpickies, really. So, I give this game a pass. For a have it your way hero that can fight any way you want, you're not tied down by fate, for clever combat systems, and the story. A little slow, but it's starting to get me hooked on to it. Even the minor ones. So, that wraps it up for today. And I'm glad to say I completely forgot about you know what game. This is one true Omnigamer Boss Braun saying good night and uh, good gaming. We've got to get you out from here now, quickly!